Okay. So the uh, next um, thing that we're going to be talking about is image export. We will interact a lot with the controls over here in the brightness and contrast. And we can stay on our Swissol h and &E image. Um, first thing that I want to show you is that if you didn't select the image type, okay, or if that image type was incorrectly assigned, you're going to get some weird, um, weird interface here. So you want to make sure that the image type is appropriate. And with keyboard keys, one, two, three, four, five, and so on, you can switch between image channels. Now, this is a red, green, and blue image, an RGB image, and it's actually a little bit of an oddity. So I'm gonna show you a little presentation now. Um, I'm hoping that, yes, people in Zoom see what I see. So just to um, reiterate your images or data, um, if you treat them nicely, they can give you a lot of info uh, on your samples. Um, so there are generally two kinds of imaging that images that we will be interacting with. Um, there is a classical images. Uh, uh, they're composed of three channels, red, green, and blue. They are together. They're often used in the clinical world. Um, um, on the other hand, uh, fluorescence imaging, um, your, your microscope, by the way, is a fluorescence microscope, not a fluorescent microscope. If someone spills something on it, it becomes a fluorescent microscope, but that's a bad thing to happen. Um, they are grayscale images. They can have 8, 16, or 32 bits. Um, what are those bits, you're asking? Um, well, a bit is a chunk of information. Um, and, and this is how um, I wanted to visualize the difference between the true color images and the grayscale images. We can color the grayscale images any way we like. Um, it, 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 it would be possible to recolor them, but they are really composed of those three, three components. So there is something that's called the bit depth, and this is how many gradations there are on the scale. Um, generally speaking, more is better. Um, with a rougher bit depth, with lower bit depth, you can um, build uh, or, or describe the images uh, in a less precise way than when you're um, using a 16 um, or 32 uh, bit images. Um, for most of the bright field images, um, you are, are gonna be using eight and eight and eight bits that will be creating your 24 bit RGB. Um, a lot of the images from the Research fluorescence slide scanners will give you 16-bit output, and that's much preferred over an 8-bit. Um, when you're doing your imaging, it's important to set your dynamic range um, in a way that will allow you to um, um, see unexpectedly high amount of signal. And if you have a good imaging system, you're also going to be able to see the very low level of signal. Um, it's important to avoid saturation on this picture of MISO. Um, you can see a good dynamic range here, and this is saturation. That information has been lost. Either there's too much signal or too little signal, and you can no longer see individual strands of her hair. So for the law of all the things that are good um, and, and kind, um, you want to generally start with the right sample and keep your settings constant. Um, if you saturate your images, you lose the information. Now, on your computer screen, you have little elements that are called pixels, and your computer screen is running in an 8-bit mode, okay? So you have 16-bit images, but you only have 8 bit of space on your computer screen. So there is a need for some kind of translation of the data that are on your computer. Whoops, there's something advancing automatically. Um, the, there is a need to translate the data that you have encoded in your images. Your images are really just numbers 
for the computer, right? They don't they don't really have any colors inside. Um, they can look the same on your screen, but have very different pixel values, or they can look different, but have the same pixel values. Getting confused? Good. Um, so lookup tables is, that's the thing, that's the tool that allows you to translate your pixel values into what you see on the screen. And we can assign many different lookup tables, and that's what we're gonna be doing now uh, in a moment. So we're gonna open the Swiss roll HE. Um, we're gonna set the HE image type. And I would like you now to switch between channels with either your control uh, on your keyboard or uh, using the brightness and contrast image. Just get familiar enough um, to understand that if you press a key on the keyboard that switches the channel and have a brief look at what those channels are. We're going to explain this in the in the future talks, but one of the most beautiful things that I uh, early on saw in QPath is that when you open an H and image, it automatically separates the hematoxin and the eosin stains, and it's doing some guesswork on how to do that, and you can improve that a lot if you choose so. And I would like to point your attention to viewer gamma. Okay, so gamma is a non-linear adjustment of the display it does not change the data, but it can help you immensely when you're working with bright field images to better see the features that you have in your image. I can see that there is this neutrophil probably um, that that's a lot easier for me to see on this image than on this image that appears to be too dark. The same for plasma cells they are easier to see when you have lower gamma. The image becomes a little brighter. And the idea here is that the way how you see through the eyepieces of the microscope versus the way how the camera records that data are two different systems and um, a linear gamma on the camera does not retranslate to our uh, human experience on the microscope. And this allows you to compensate for that. Okay, so go ahead and try to do this in QPAT. Go to brightness and contrast and move that slider. So much better now. Look at that. Hold shift and click and you're going to go back to the original. Now, maybe you know, you're going to be asking a colleague for help. And the task is going to be to manually count those plasma cells because obviously there's no other way to do it, right? <laughs> um, and, you know, that colleague is going to be looking for these plasma cells with this setting, and you're going to be looking for them with this setting. Any problems that potentially can happen here, right? So you can save your settings. And those settings are then recallable from the project. Um, maybe you just want to focus on the hematoxin channels. You can save those settings. Maybe you want to adjust those settings and the way how the viewer displays the image. We can discuss, you know, um, the best practices, but. The point of all of this that we're doing here is to visualize the data. You need to see the data in, in the right way before you can analyze them. Okay. Cool. All right. So there is this channel that's called optical density sum, and that's under keyboard shortcut number five. That is very helpful when you're working with um, hematoxin and DAB like images. And the point that I want to make, that those adjustments are super useful when working with fluorescence data. 
Okay, so you know your your collaborators calling you. Hey, can you send me quick snapshots? Um, I have a presentation in ten minutes. Can you just send them over to my email? Um, so what do you do? You adjust the viewer. You annotate what you want to show. For example, with the arrows. Um, you, if you like, you can hide the slide overview and cursor location with those buttons here. Slide overview, cursor location, scale bar. Keep the scale bar. Um, and then you can go to edit, copy to clipboard, current viewer. The thing that you see on your screen is going to be copied to your clipboard. Go ahead and give it a try. I'm not going to demonstrate this. You can try it on your own. Um, if you need to save the image, you can export snapshot current viewer. Okay, it's just what you see on the screen. It's just that viewer. Any adjustments that you that image will be saved as either PNG, JPEG, or TIFF. And um, if we had a little bit more time, we would go into what those other options are doing. But I encourage you to explore them on your own later on. I would recommend PNG. For a quick emailing and that kind of stuff, this is perfect. This is not a, you know, a, a scientific image that you're getting. You want to put better scale bars. Do yourself a favor, go to preferences and make it huge, make it bold, increase the slide, the scale bar thickness. Give it a try. So the, the, the scale bar is designed to show on various kinds of images. So it's actually going to change the appearance as you're moving through the image or with different image, imaging types. But there is an option to export uh, images to external programs. And this is what we're going to do now. So you can specify an annotation the way I showed you before where you go to objects, annotations, specify annotations, or you can just create, uh, let's say a rectangle of annotation somewhere in the field of view. I'm gonna demonstrate that. Hey, Mike, could you put that um, part of the presentation in the side screen? So I will grab a region of interest and I'm gonna, Send region to image A. Okay, so that um, window pops up. Software asks me if I want to change the resolution of the image. And for now, I'm going to choose, I'm not going to change anything. And I'm going to click OK. And a built in image J will pop up and here we can use the same uh, shortcut that we used before to insert a scale bar. So we can go command and L that will find commands in image J, scale bar, run. And then we can specify its width. Let's say we're gonna make it 100 um microns location let's say lower left well 100 micro meters would be a little bit too high so let's go with 10. we can change the font size here And I will, for now, uncheck the overlay. There are reasons for those choices. Um, and I have my image with a scale bar that's burned into it. it. Then I can go to File, Save As, Save As TIFF, for example. Now, one thing that I wanted to uh, point out is that is that this image 
has 800 by 900 pixels. Have any of you heard of this thing when you're ready to publish your image and the editor comes back to you and it's like, your image are not of sufficient quality. You need at least 300 and what's the word? DPI. DPI. What DPI stands for? Is. Excellent. Pixels per inch would be an equivalent of that. So an image that has 900 DPI, sorry, that has 900 pixels, how large can it be on a printed sheet of paper? One, two, or three inches. Exactly. Excellent. Exactly. Right? That's the conversion. That's the way how it works. So you have the number of pixels, you divide it by the needed DPI, and you will see how big this image can be um, on a printed piece of paper. The reason why you want to care about DPI is shown on this image. Images that don't have enough resolution, enough DPI, will be very pixelated, as we call it. Um, like shown here. Um, and the, the funny thing that this is actually a calendar from one of the microscopy companies, um, so they should know better. Um, and if you zoom in on that quite a bit, you're actually gonna see that there are points, there are little dots, and those dots have cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. Have anybody heard that dreaded word CMYK, right? So this is about the way how we describe color. On your monitor, there are three pixels, red, green, and blue. In printing process, there are those four inks. It is almost impossible to transfer certain colors from one color space to another. Uh, thankfully, we mostly live in a digital world now, and most of our publications go to digital um, um, publishing, um, where that conversion no longer um, takes your beautifully stained uh, uh, nuclei and turn them into something that looks like a blob that is unrecognizable. Um, okay, and you may ask me, um, how do I convert to 300 DPI? And the answer is you Google it, okay? There is a lot that you can find on the internet. This is a whole story. Um, on how to prepare your images for final publication, I highly recommend that guide from um, Nature Research Journal Group, um, where they kind of tell you step-by-step step what are the important considerations. And the funny thing is that they recommend you to use Microsoft PowerPoint. And that is because it is a vector-based graphics program. So you can use Illustrator, but you should not use um, Photoshop for your images for your assemblage of final figures. And the reason why you shouldn't use Photoshop is that is it is a software tool that uses bitmaps. So it, it like uses pictures, whereas vector-based graphics, if you zoom into it and zoom into it and zoom into it and zoom into it, it will still have the same shape. It's just like in QPath, you are zooming in and you start to see individual pixels, but this annotation line always stays nice and sharp because this is a vector and that is a bitmap. I hope I confused you enough to refer back to this uh, beautiful guide on why um, vector graphics is actually better for uh, doing your final assembly of figures. And here is why. If you, for example, would want to export a couple of images from QPath that have, for best practice, I would recommend, you know, make them, make them equal. If you're showing um, certain features of your inflammatory phenotype, you know, make them so that they are equal in size. So if you have um, a few panels, right, that you're gonna assemble later on, um, make them of the same size. So now, 
when you export the data by going to export images, rendered RGB with overlays, for example, that's going to be a different kind of export. That's going to be a type of export that allows you to export high resolution uh, images um, that are uncompressed, that are good for publication. And the output in pixels is going to be given here. I can save that image. When I open it, it's, it's going to show me um, show show me that. And we know that one that width of that image is three hundred microns. We know that. Okay, so a third of that would be a hundred. So I can go to my PowerPoint and I can essentially put a scale bar on the top of that image. Um, and the reason why they like to do that is because they can change all overlaid elements and make sure that they're harmonized throughout the figure. What typically happens in scientific publishing is that a postdoc is putting, uh, or a grad student is putting a figure together, right? And then that figure is usually for presentation, right, at <laughs> the lab meeting. And that figure then gets shrinked down to a size that's going to be manageable for putting it into the paper. And then all of those labels, all of those, those little things get so small that no one can read them. And that's why they don't want you to have all of those elements that are flattened, that are embedded in the image. Something interesting. In a couple of years ago, they, they would they would just execute you for for you know trying to submit an image in, in PowerPoint, but the software caught up. It's not compressing images anymore. You can set it up so that the quality is yes. Please. There were some academic licenses of PowerPoint where they actually do compress images because uh, if you have PowerPoint like in OneDrive or whatever stored in the cloud, so you have to go into the options and specifically uncheck the box that says. Do not compress images in this presentation. And it should save it for either that presentation or all of them. And if you want a true vector-based graphics software design that is open source and free, go with Inkspace. Um, we're probably going to touch base on how to export um, high quality images a little bit later. But one question to you, why cannot I just export the image as it is? What's the problem with the huge image that they have opened in Cuba? It take all your memory. Yes, it will take up all of your memory. It has enormous size. You wouldn't be even able to open it. So what you can do instead is you downsample that image. You can essentially throw away some pixels and make it smaller, more manageable. You will lose resolution. But if you're going for an overview of a piece of tissue, you don't need that resolution. You're not, not even going to zoom in to, to, to see it. So it's good. It's good. It's good. OK, so um, there is a lot of um, interest in making sure that our imaging and science in general is more reproducible. Um, there are some guidelines of how we need to store the metadata. Now there are also guidelines of how to develop <laughs> Um, images uh, for our publication and images analysis. And you can see that this is a community effort, right? So there's lots and lots of people who contribute to that. And they came up with those um, checklists um, that are meant to be user-friendly, um, where they show you, okay, if you want to show some images in your manuscript, um, you need to think and, 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 and do those things. For example, you know, your 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 brightness and contrast adjustments need to be uniform. Or if you make them ununiform, you need to very clearly inform the reader that those settings have been changed. Otherwise, you can miscommunicate something. Um, you know, uh, if if your channels are merged, make it accessible to colorblind people, and so on and so forth. Okay, so we've been playing just a little bit with the H and E. Now let's add kidney WJ one, two, and three to a project. Yeah. 
kidney one, two, and three. I happen to know that those images are fluorescence. So I can select it already the key port. Now if I switch to that image, I'm gonna be something something like that. And at this point in time, it is quite helpful to see that this badge shows us that something needs our attention, and that's the gamma. When working with fluorescence images, it's best to switch that gamma to one. Okay, so let's zoom in a little bit, and let's quickly talk about our channels that we have in this image. We have DNA marker, and we can show or hide it, one on your keyboard is going to toggle that channel. Two on your keyboard is going to toggle the second channel. That is out of fluorescence. And the third channel is here. So my question to you is, is this a real staining or this is an artifact? And if you compare it to the autofluorescence, you're probably going to be able to tell that this is an artifact. But let's make it a little bit easier. Let's click on that and change the color to green. And now let's adjust that. So, so we're going to be able to see a little bit better that the common parts of that image between those two channels are white. And that's how out of fluorescence would look like if we are looking primarily at two channels. One of them is green and one of them is magenta, because when you add those two colors, that turns into white. So remember, in the good old days, we had primarily been working with green and red. But that is very colorblind unfriendly. Um, and green and magenta would be the recommended combination. So you adjust the settings by changing the minimum and the maximum value for each individual channel. And you need to click on the channel in order to interact with it. You also get this nice little histogram here. Okay, so you can adjust the values. Now, one thing that you shouldn't do is you shouldn't hide the background. You shouldn't do something like this. Uh, background exists, it's there. Um, it is important for our ability to understand what is the signal and what is noise. I'll be mentioning what WGA is. And WGA, is a molecule, it's a lectin that binds to sugars. That is uh, a lectin that's um, quite nicely binding to um, the borders of kidney epithelial cells right here. Um, our DNA dye in this case was hexed. Okay, how many of you are comfortable with adjusting the viewer where you can, okay. So getting pretty close. I'm gonna right click on that image, multi-view, set grid size, go with grid two by one. Aha, uh -huh. so we have an additional viewer that we can click on to activate it. And then you double click to populate that. Now what happened is that new image um, changed our um, way how the, how the image is displayed. That's fine. And this one is zoomed in and this one is zoomed out. So if I, if I click on this viewer to activate it and right click, match viewer resolutions, 
that image is going to be at the same level of magnification that this image. If I now drag them, they both move synchronously. Open brightness and contrast. Make sure that apply to similar images is on. And change away and observe the magic of those images changing in certain synchrony between them. Okay, so if you have applied to similar images open uh, or checked, if you change something in that brightness and contrast, it will apply to all of those images at the same time. So why I find it super cool because it saves me a gazillion hours of time. We often need to share with someone the results of the experiment. And I can add my control and my staining and my autofluorescence and however many conditions they have. And I can adjust them all simultaneously so they're all the same. And I can go to tool, edit, copy to clipboard, main window content. And that's going to copy what I see right now. And I'm going to be able to paste it into my email and say it worked. Uh, remember that you can switch to a different uh, type of viewer with the mo mo Moderna Black team. Uh, theme. Be colorblind friendly. Um, remember that humans do not have uniform color perception. Try it. Go to your viewer, select only a single channel. Let's select WGA and change the color from magenta to blue to grayscale. And see for yourself that your color perception is actually different. Pixel values didn't change. We changed the lookup tables. And yet your eyes are perceiving blue as being a lot dimmer than magenta. And your grayscale is always going to look the best. And that's the reason why in those um, checklists, they suggest that if you are exporting a multi-panel image that has a lot of colors on them, consider adding a grayscale versions of those because on the grayscale, you can much more precisely see the differences in, 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 the, in, in the image. Okay, so we covered making use of autofluorescence. For a few people in this audience who um, have pathologists on board but would, would like to run fluorescence, um, there is a way to convert those images that you're working on on something that looks like pseudo h &E, and pseudo the uh, And that can hopefully cross the bridge between the um, pathology world and the uh, fluorescence world. Um, you do this by inverting the background. And then you can assign colors um, to hematoxin. You can make it navy and out of fluorescence, which often resembles eosinin, you can make it magenta. And then that image looks like this. And if you want to throw in something that, you know, people are often so familiar with the DAV that if they see fluorescence, they cannot really recognize what they're looking at. Um, you can you can get it to work this way. Okay. Um, so I'm going to finish by showing you how to adjust channel names. So you go to brightness and contrast. You double click on the name and you can rename it. Okay, so we have this multi-channel image. I'm gonna hide all the channels first, and I'm gonna see hex CD31 and CD163 to begin with, and I'm gonna save this as my first 
panel of colors. And then I'm gonna go with um, C11C, CD, uh, CD20, and CD4, and I'm gonna save it as my second panel of colors. And then I'm gonna go with whatever else I want to go with, CD45, CD8, PD1, black uh, box between the same. Okay, so now I can quickly switch between those groupings of channels. So I didn't have to figure, I didn't have to fumble with the image. The image is as, 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 as it was, I don't have to, you know, duplicate it, increase the size, stuff like that. Um, and I can just go through and change the display this way. Much appreciated change. 